Good morning, everyone. We'd like to get started today with symposium number 29. It starts with a diagnosis, best practices for CF newborn screening. I'm Marcy Sontag. I'm with the Center for Public Health Innovation in Colorado. And my co-moderator is Dr. Susanna McCauley, who is running a little behind this morning, so she will be here shortly. I have my colleagues, um, Yvonne Keller-Gunther, here to help me time. So first, I'll start with our um, NACF presentation disclaimer that the views presented here, I guess explicitly do not present the um, views of the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. And that's true for our whole entire presentation today. Um, and Dr. McCauley has received fees from Vertex. I do not have any um, disclosures to present today. So now let me start by introducing myself for my presentation. So I am going to, I'm really excited today to be talking to you about our newly minted CF newborn screening um, guidelines. Um, and a little bit of background, so it probably is very clear to everyone in this room, newborn screening has been available in the US since 2010. And while there has been universal adoption of CF newborn screening, there's quite a bit of variability across states, which leads to variabilities in outcomes for children related to the time of diagnosis and even the diagnosis itself. Further, the minoritized population groups are disproportionately impacted and may have even further delayed diagnosis. So it's because of this, for the past several years, we've been looking to improve that and realize that the equity, sensitivity, and timeliness of CF could be improved through the adoption of consensus-driven guidelines. When we set out with this consensus-driven guidelines on what I'm going to be presenting today, we really have the goal of all programs should be able to reach at least 95% of true positive detection with CF across all ancestral groups. And that all ancestral groups is important so we can really reach that equity we really desire in CF newborn screening. So to achieve that, the CF guidelines describe practice recommendations across four categories, IRT thresholds, CFTR variant screening panels, the application of CFTR sequencing approaches and communication strategies. So I'll walk through our recommendations in each of those four areas. For those of you who have participated in guidelines, you realize this is a very onerous task. I am presenting our methods here on one slide. If you'd like more details about our methods, please refer to our manuscript that hopefully all of you have been able to read now, but this has been a multi-year process. So we had a multidisciplinary committee who conducted six systematic reviews, we encompassed all areas of um, CF newborn screening, and not addressed in this was the cost effectiveness, resource allocation, and those two are really critical things, and they're very specific at the jurisdictional level. So these are broader than outside of the scope of what we were doing with our um, guidelines. We also did not discuss CRMS CF SPID because those were addressed in a very well-written guideline by Dr. Deanna Green, or led by Dr. Deanna Green and her team um, this, earlier this year. Race and ethnicity for the purposes of this are reported as Asian, Black, Hispanic, and other minoritized populations. So when we're talking about that equity, those are the groups that we're really trying to reach equity for. So we had six PICO questions that were developed to inform our systematic reviews, and we actually have seven recommendations that came out of this. So you get one bonus recommendation from our six PICO questions. The committee convened to vote in July of 2024, and we 80% was our minimum that we needed to have for our approval. And the manuscript was distributed for public comment on September 17th. Hopefully you've all had a chance to read that. I'll have the QR code at the end of my presentation so you can read it later if you have it. And so now what you've all been waiting for, the consensus recommendations. Here they are in tabular form, and I'm gonna go through each of these. I'm not expecting for you to read them. They're in the four categories I discussed earlier. But I think important to note here is the percentage agreement here on the right side. We reached 100% agreement from this committee. And when you have a group, a multidisciplinary group of very passionate, well-educated folks in a room to receive 100% agreement, reach 100% agreement on anything is impressive. So um, that speaks to the strength that we felt about these recommendations. So first, the recommendations related to immunoreactive trypsinogen, or IRT. First recommendation is that the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation recommends the use of a floating immunoreactive trypsinogen cutoff over a fixed immunoreactive, immunoreactive trypsinogen cutoff. 
And so why? Why was this an important recommendation for us? Missed cases, historically, missed cases in CF newborn screening have typically been because of IRT. We've been chasing that ideal IRT cutoff for decades. Um, fl a floating IRT cutoff will typically account for seasonal variations, temperature variations, lot-to-lot -lot variations, kit-to-kit -kit variations, and just shifts in IRT over time. The caveat to this is that cutoff is really important. I've had some of you approach me and say, what should we use? What should that floating cutoff be? Say in the literature, you'll see most often used as 95 or 96 percentile, but we really need programs to look at their own data to evaluate that. However, a very high floating cutoff of 99.9 .9 percentile will likely perform worse than a fixed IRT cutoff of 50. So you really need to evaluate that within your own programs. Our second recommendation is that the CF Foundation recommends using a very high immunoreactive trypsinogen referral strategy in CF newborn screening programs whose variant panel does not include all known pathogenic variants in CFTR2 or does not have a variant panel that achieves at least 95% sensitivity in all ancestral groups within the state. I will let you know that this recommendation, I think, surprised us all that we came to this conclusion. In fact, even the referral, the group who studied this carefully was like, I, we, they initially thought they were going to recommend against this particular recommendation. But we think it is absolutely very, one of the most critical recommendations we have. And so, for those of you not familiar, in very high IRT strategy, infants with very high IRTs, say above 140, 150, 160 set by the panel or above the 99.8th or 99.9th percentile, who have no detected variants following panel testing on newborn screening, are then called screen positive. So they're infants with zero variants, but have a very high IRT. Um, and we know we're doing this because CFTR variant panels miss infants with less common variants, and those less common variants are typically seen in infants from minoritized populations. So this is one of our most critical elements for equity that we have come forth with, is that to really identify those infants who may not have a variant on a panel, we recommend that you use a very high IRT. Many of you out there will notice this last bullet and say, yep, that's what we saw, that very high IRT has a low positive predictive value. We have, we recognize that, and yet, we think even though it has a low positive predictive value, it is worth that extra effort in order to ensure equity in our CF newborn screening programs. Recommendations related to CFTR panel testing. Recommendation three, the CF Foundation recommends that CF newborn screening algorithms should not limit CFTR variant detection to the F508 Dell variant or variants included in the ACMG 23 panel. This one was a home run for us, kind of a slam dunk but we thought it was important enough to call out to say, you can't be just using one variant or a very small panel, because limiting that panel really limits the sensitivity of your overall CF detection program. In published literature, it's between 56 to 90%, and that's even worse in minoritized populations. So this is something that is just foundational, that if you are in a state who's using, a, or any jurisdiction that's using just an F508 or the very limited 23 ACMG panel, we recommend very strongly that you move to something else. Which leads us to maybe our most ambitious of our recommendations. The CF Foundation recommends that cystic fibrosis newborn screening panels screen for all pathogenic CFTR variants in CFTR2. If you've noticed, then the latest version has almost 1,100 variants that are tested in this panel. So, why do we do this? We know that screening for all known parent Pathogenic variants in CFTR2 is going to improve sensitivity in the overall population, and it's particularly going to improve sensitivity in minoritized populations, in Asian, Black, and Hispanic populations. This is critical, right? You're screening for all of them. I'm going to walk through what this might look like in a figure in just a couple minutes of how that might really implement itself. But if you were to do this, you would say, if infants have two variants on this panel, they are positive, they are presumptive positive for CF. If they have one variant, we don't need to call them out, and we're done. And so that eliminates a lot of the stress to CF newborn screening programs. Recommendation five. The CF Foundation recommends conducting CFTR variant screening twice weekly or more frequently as resources allow. So this is really a timeliness recommendation. We know that many factors influence the timeliness of CF newborn screening. It could be the time of the collection of the specimen in the hospital, shipping methods and frequency, 
the laboratory hours, when do they open, how often do they test their dried blood spots, all of these things influence it. But if we can get to everyone screening CFTR variants at least twice a week, that will shorten that delay for um, CF newborn screening. And we know that those who did that had a shorter time, an earlier first CF visit than those who screened once a week or less frequently. Next, recommendations related to CFTR sequencing. The CF Foundation recommends the inclusion of a CFTR sequencing tier following IRT and CFT variant panel testing to improve the specificity and positive predictive value of CF newborn screening. The CFT variant panel we're thinking would be in the newborn screening program. We're not asking for a clinical sequencing panel. This would be, or a clinical sequencing, this would be as part of the newborn screening um, system and algorithm. So this is really the discussion of this is the recommendation is that infants with one pathogenic variant following panel testing should have sequencing of all exons, flanking introns, and specific intronic variants. We do recognize, however, that this will not pick up all um, variants in CFTR, structural variants, deep intronic variants may be missed. And further, with this step, following the sequencing step, if you only are reporting out those with two known pathogenic variants, you are decreasing the sweat tests, um, the burden for sweat tests. So we're not going to call out those infants with one variant, which also decreases the burden to families. We also believe, really, you'll notice a the theme here, that this can result in a more equitable um, screening program, and also it's more specific and a more timely diagnosis for everyone. All right, recommendations related to communication. The CF Foundation recommends that both the primary care provider and CF specialist be notified of abnormal newborn screening results. This varies depending on program right now. In some programs, the CF center is notified, some programs the PCP is notified, and in many programs, it varies depending on if an infant has one or two variants. We think that both, notifying both, will increase the likelihood of a correct assessment of the infant's risk and get the right information into the family's hands. Families really, in our literature review, preferred to have information from trusted medical providers. They wanted the CF specialist to have, be notified of the positive results, and they want prompt notification from a healthcare provider that's knowledgeable about CF. They want the right information early. We also know from some of the research that we've done that some PCPs may misinform families due to a misconception that CF only affects infants who are not Hispanic white. So finally in this realm of this is no matter what you're doing, a well-defined, consistent, and reproducible system is necessary. You have to have something that everyone knows what role they play and how is that child going to get into care. It's critical for the success and the um, proper education of the family to get them in early. All right, so now we have an overview of an algorithm. Some of you have been in earlier sessions this week and may have seen this figure. And so I feel like this is one of those highlights games where it's like what's different and what's the same because we've changed this figure a little bit reflecting from your comments that we've received. So I'd like to give you the flow chart of what does an ideal newborn screening algorithm look like and the decision points you would have in changing your algorithm. If you were to go home and talk to your newborn screening program, what changes would you make? So following the IRT, or thinking about the IRT measurement, the first question to ask is, is the IRT threshold floating or fixed? If it's fixed, we recommend recommendation one. Think about that, implement a floating IRT threshold. So you say, well, I have a floating one, so then you move on to the CFT variant panel. So, oops, went too fast, see over here, we, uh, this is recommendation five, we recommend that you perform that CFTR variant panel twice weekly or more frequently. And then when you get to the CFTR variant panel, you ask, hey, does my CFTR variant panel include all pathogenic variants in CFTR2? If the answer is yes, you proceed down to this bottom box and you refer only infants with two identified pathogenic variants for sweat testing. And you're done. And you're done. This gets infants in earlier. It gets infants in with a presumptive positive CF diagnosis and you're eliminating all of that extra testing with um, carriers, right, and taking that stress off those families. If your answer is no, that it does not include all pathogenic CFTR variants, you say, well, I'm going to implement a panel, I need to implement the panel that includes all those pathogenic variants. That's very, uh, um, recommendations three and four. 
We'd also ask you to say, well, is sequencing performed? We're not doing the big panel, but we are identifying infants with one variant. Are we doing sequencing after that? If that answer there is no, then you need to say, well, we need to consider implementing CFTR sequencing, which is recommendation six. And then we move on to say, well, if CF, if further down that panel, if CFTR sequencing is performed and you say, yes, it is performed, then you can say in that realm as well, we're only gonna refer infants with two CFTR variants. So you're not sending all those other families to sweat testing. You're saving the sweat testing and again, the stress on the families. If CFTR sequencing is not performed, you're gonna refer infants with one or two pathogenic variants because you may have missed some of those variants, right? So you have not done the big panel, you have not done sequencing, you need to move down into referring infants with one or two variants, similar to what most of us are doing now. And then the last question is, does this variant stage, whether it be the panel or your sequencing or any of those, does it achieve 95% detection? And does it achieve 95% detection across all ancestral groups? If that answer is no, you think you're receiving, you're at 93rd percentile, you're at 90th percentile sensitivity for all um, ancestral groups in your population, you need to implement that very high IRT strategy or recommendation too. And if that's the case, you then get to that last box in the bottom saying referring infants with zero variants and very high IRT with, for sweat testing. There it is. Okay, yay. So I know many of you have seen various versions of this. This is slightly modified because we got feedback from you on questions. So this is exactly what we need, is we need more feedback and questions so we can keep uh, making these changes. So considerations related to these um, guidelines. First, sensitivity of the program should be regularly reviewed. Newborn screening programs are typically doing this, but having that partnership with you is important, and having that partnership with you where you're saying, hey, here's the cases that we have missed in our CF newborn screening program. That's critical, so they have that feedback, and you know, who, how, who have we missed, and how do we continue to improve our program? The very high IRT recommendation is not recommended for infants in the NICU. IRT is routinely elevated in premature infants, and there are CLSI guidelines on how to deal with infants in the NICU, so we do not in, um, recommend using that very high IRT for NICU infants. We do believe that timeliness and equity can be improved with sequencing using CFTR2, and only referring infants with two variants identified. And we recognize that there are currently no commercially available CFTR panels that include all disease-causing variants in CFTR2. So really what you're gonna end up doing is some form of sequencing to get to that level of CFTR2 um, representation. Um, and you also say, well, yeah, my state can't sequence, and there's all these laboratory-developed test rules from the FDA, and there's all these challenges. I will let you know that we are working with the CF Foundation to find solutions for um, helping you with sequencing at other labs. So stand by into 2025 and we'll have some additional news on that. Finally, infants born to a birthing parent on CFT or modulator therapy during pregnancy may have a normal newborn screening result and needs to have special attention and collaboration between all of the groups caring for that family. Finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about education. Newborn screening programs need to continue to develop program, educational programs for PCPs. Newborn screening is a screen. Look at that, it's right in the name. It's a screen, it's not 100%. And as our goal, we said, we wanna reach at least 95% sensitivity. So, pediatricians will see this and say, oh, you know, the, the screen is negative, especially in minoritized populations, and say, yeah, oh, this child is not likely to have CF because they are black. And so it's a normal, newborn screen is normal, and they will go down in a whole other path to find the diagnosis, find other diagnoses for that child. And we need to do that education to say, if the child is experiencing any sort of symptoms related to CF, perform a sweat test. Perform a sweat test. This is incredibly important. And there's lots of educational efforts, including some led by Dr. Susanna McCulley, to make sure this happens. So we are working with that as well, but we need everyone in the, at the state levels to be working on this. So public comment is open till October 8th. So if you have questions, you say, I would like to know about this. This wasn't quite clear in the paper. We need something else in these guidelines. This is the time to let us know. So this was very carefully timed to happen right at this time, so you guys would be here, you can ask us questions, we can modify our figures, be thinking about how to make these recommendations more clear. So we really ask you all to give us those comments back. 
This QR code will take you to the SurveyMonkey. You can get the manuscript itself, as well as a link to provide us comments. So I'd like to end with acknowledgments. I'd like to thank the CF newborn screening and research communities for sharing your data. This is, public health doesn't publish a lot of this type of data. It was hard to find some of these. We went through thousands of articles to find what we found. And we'd like to thank those of you in the room who did this. And if you are working in CF newborn screening, please publish your work. So when we come back around to, re to modify these recommendations, we have even more data to build this on. I'd like to thank the CF patients and families for their patience as we have worked through and improved CF newborn screening over the years. Um, Eileen Wofford and the Northwestern staff for their work in pulling all of the documents. And then the committee members, many of who are in the room, thank you so much for your hard work on doing this. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention and be happy to take some questions. Hi, yes. Katie Singh, genetic counselor for Miller Children's. Thank you for this. Um, I really appreciated it. One kind of nitpicky comment is on your beautiful flowchart. You reference pathogenic variants, which as a genetic counselor, I totally agree with and is the right term to use. But many newborn screening programs, including my own, do not follow ACMG guidelines for reporting and don't call them pathogenic on the reports. And CFTR2 calls them CF-causing variants, not pathogenic. And so from the state interpretation perspective, that guideline could conflict with, it could cause confusion. Yeah. So Katie, that's, CFTR2 that's... CFTR2 is disease-causing variants with clini varying clinical consequence and not CF-causing. And so if you're recommending to follow CFTR2, there's already a mismatch. And then many states aren't using pathogenic, likely pathogenic, VUS, likely benign, benign, as defined by ACMG. Katie, that is an absolutely excellent point, And that's something that we can incorporate. How do we, how do we tie these to each other and have that Karen mapping? Karen help you do that. So you're sat with Karen. Mm -hmm. Karen is on our committee and yeah, she is amazing. So we will, I, that's great. I already did a public comment. I didn't catch it until you put it up here. So okay. that's my public comment. Well, Katie, can I encourage you to put that also in the public comment? Because it's important. Do our backup and I'll do it right now? I will do it. Yes, that's a, oh. Yeah, you can make as many public comments as you want. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Susanna McCauley. I deeply apologize for being late. And I recommend that if you want to double check a video that you uploaded at a speaker ready room, you get there at least half an hour as opposed to 20 minutes uh. <laughs> before, in case it isn't working. Um, but I, I want to thank um, Marcy for uh, forging on. And um, after uh, the next question, we've got a couple in the um, uh, online platform. Perfect. So please. Let's go. Hi, up, oh, yeah, go ahead. From oh, go ahead, Mel. Oh, sorry. My question between like the fellow session yesterday, I, I'm from Connecticut and I've been in the collaborative. So people talk about repeating newborn screens. And I'm not familiar with doing that typically for our program. It's one and done, you get it. If it's very high, uh, we continue to do, we've always done sweat tests for those patients. And I did get like an excellent explanation from the fellow yesterday, but of course then she was presenting how the kid had CF. So um, I'm just questioning that because it's, it's not mentioned in here. Yeah, and so we would not, there's no state where, or no place where we're here recommending getting a second IRT, except for in states who have two IRTs. Yeah, this seems this, to be like the baby had a transfusion. Yeah, know so there, there, are, there are a lot I of situations. A the, on this. So yeah. in Illinois, um, you know, there is this within 24 hours IRT for sick babies. Sick babies often have a very high IRT. And so it's repeated then at sort of the normal time, about 48 hours. So the ones that start very high but are, are below our threshold, and we use a very sensitive threshold, top 4% of IRT go to the next stage. We have done that and we have not found false negative cases with that, although it doesn't mean that they will never exist. I'm going to go over to this microphone next. I, I oh. want to follow up on that directly. Oh, yeah. Because that might have been my fellow. Um, we, okay. well, we have a very similar case um, where, like, kids in the NICU will get transfused and then they'll repeat an IRT or they'll repeat the whole newborn screen. IRT looks better. So it's been a little bit of a challenge sometimes, including talking to parents afterwards, saying the first one was elevated. We found DNA changes. 
they repeated the newborn screen, going to second IRT days or a week later that is normal. And that's causing confusion and people are thinking, oh, well, the newborn screen was negative. We go based on the first one and we look for DNA on a panel. Um, but that has been a bit of a challenge. Yeah, that wasn't something that we specifically addressed in these guidelines. And it makes me think maybe in our considerations we need to add that because I think the recommendation would be don't perform DNA on a, the DNA test on that first elevated IRT of an infant in the NICU because you're going to have that confusion. It's likely going to normalize and then do it, as Susanna said, on that second IRT, that second dried blood spot specimen a few days later. Correct. Yeah, remember, the IRT goes down pretty quickly. Um, but I'm also going to make a comment that I make a lot. Publish your work. <laughs> this, is, this was based on a large literature search. There are nuances that we kind of know about, but we don't have an evidence base. So um, I think it's super important to get it out there. We've got some questions over here. Hi. Um, excuse me. I'm from Texas, and um, we've been an IRT, IRT DNA state, uh, and now we're kind of like an IRT and a half IRT. In June, they, what, they um, implemented the very high IRT um, uh, reflex to, to DNA, to the panel, and... <clears throat> as you would have expected, I'm getting all kinds of referrals for NICU babies. And these, we can't sweat these babies um, because they're in, other, they're in other hospitals in the NICU. And it kind of makes me wonder if I should be recommending that they do full sequencing while the baby's in the NICU, or should I just leave it alone, or should I follow up and just say, how's the baby doing? You know, is there, are there suspicions? Yeah. What? I, I'm not really sure what to what to think. So I'm going to say um, there should be some kind of clinical conversation. Um, if a baby is on total parenteral nutrition, if they're getting care for their lungs that they need, um, the uh, the next step that we often recommend is to do DNA, but. Um, let's say a baby is in an unclear situation and you're really gonna need a sweat test to make that diagnosis and the baby's too small and sick to really have a good sweat test, treat that baby presumptively for CF. If they're eating pancreatic enzymes or getting tube feedings, you know, some enzymes and salt can be life-saving and certainly in the long run, growth-saving, which is life-saving. Um, and then you can make a diagnosis later. And that's also true of these kids who are equivocal or have QNS sweat tests who aren't perfectly healthy. Um, because actually diagnosing people, although it's the theme today, um, is there can be a time period in which presumptive treatment is needed as you're sorting out the diagnosis. And we do that in other disorders too, you know. Um, so I think that that's really the, the important point. But there are strategies that are IRT, DNA, IRT as well. And I actually would say, adding on to Susanna, the clinical conversation is critically important. And in an IRT, IRT, DNA state, you have the advantage of that second specimen is going to be collected anyway. You could re go back in the NICU population only, go back to just IRT, IRT, DNA, wait for that second specimen to come in, see if that IRT is normalized, and then do the DNA. So if the Texas lab had that ability to flag who's in the NICU and who's not, they could determine that, and you would probably have many fewer of those that are going to be critical, and you wait a few days, and you can make that decision. And one more nuance, many um, states will run DNA on a baby that you're worried about. So we do this all the time with subsequent siblings who have not had prenatal testing. We let the state know the baby's born. Can you run the DNA on the blood spot regardless of the IRT? And they do it for us. So that, that's a different situation because you know what the variants are in the sibling. But it's another way um, that you can sort of try to get that baby diagnosed earlier. Thank you. 
So let's do Mike, and then let's go on to the questions in the app, and then we probably need to move on to our next presenter. Thanks, Marcy. Thanks, Marcy. Yeah, I, my let's question. Gonna, let's um, I'm going to no, invite no. people who ask questions to email us directly, make public comments, or um, come up after the session so you get your questions answered. Perfect. So go my, ahead, Mike. My question is: Is you, if you follow the new algorithm with the the you know CFTR2 pathogenic mutations and everything, so one mutation is considered a negative screen. Is there utility in notifying families of their child's carrier status? Oh, uh, this is the so, thousand dollar. I'm going to leave that one to you. Th so. Thanks, okay. Mike. And so I am going to say, I think that's a very philosophical and ethical discussion. I think a lot of the genetic counselors in the room might say, you know what, we can get, we do not need to do that. But I think that's a discussion you'd have to have with your state. But I would also say Eleanor is going to be talking about that in just two talks from now, and she's going to be addressing some of those issues. So stick around, and we'll come back to it. But it's a, it's a great question. All right, would you like to tee up the next talk? This is our video. I, I can get it ready, but I think if you want to do the introduction of it. Yes. Um, so uh, I would like to introduce our next um, speaker or speakers. Um, I, our next topic is beyond the state house. Um, it's about advocacy that's not direct to legislators. And I had invited uh, Terry and Michelle Wright to speak today, but they are actually speaking at a rare disease conference with NIH and other staff. And so um, I'm grateful for the American Thoracic Society staff because they spoke at the ATS meeting this year and we got a little room and we made a little video. So um, this is the disclosure for the rights. They um, founded and uh, lead the National Organization of African Americans with Cystic Fibrosis. Um, and they have been uh, working very, very hard to raise awareness and improve policy around newborn screening um, so that every child with CF has a good opportunity. Um, and I think many of you know Terry's story, but um, let's go ahead with the video and hope that it works this time. So it is my pleasure then to introduce Rachel Linneman. Um, Rachel Linneman is with Emory University and Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, and she's also the CF Center Director. And Tanisha Daly is a pediatric endocrinologist, also with Emory University and Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. You guys both like to come on up. Thank you, Marcy and Susanna, for inviting us to speak today. Um, and good morning, everyone. We are excited to have the opportunity to share with you today our advocacy efforts to improve CF newborn screening in the state of Georgia and beyond. Dr. Daly and I both received grant support from the CF Foundation, which is related to this presentation. So my call to action actually started about five years ago when I became CF Center Director at Children's in Emory in Atlanta. And soon after I became director, we had two children who were diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. Um, both had been missed by our newborn screen in Georgia, which uses a 39 variant panel. Both were minoritized children and um, had two rare CFTR variants. So I actually reached out to our newborn screen program to report those cases, and I discovered that there was actually no systematic way of tracking missed cases in our state. At the same time, I was hearing stories from families, and I wanted to share some quotes that were collected by one of our former fellows, Dr. Brandt, during a qualitative research study, and this was also presented at poster 447. One mother shared with us that the pediatrician said, oh, she is African American, she doesn't have cystic fibrosis for eight months, even though it came up on her newborn screening. Another mother shared with us that their pediatrician said, it's not common amongst black people, so you don't have anything to worry about. So she kind of let it go for a while. And then another mother said that her OBGYN did a prenatal screening, which showed she was a carrier. But then the OBGYN said, said to her, quote, I didn't need to worry about it because I wasn't white and there would be no chance, if not any, that my child would have CF. 
At the same time, our pediatric CF population in Georgia is very diverse. So here it's shown in blue, and this includes patients from both our Atlanta program as well as the only other CF center in Georgia, which is our Augusta program led by Dr. Katie Mackey. Um, and you can see it's compared to our, um, in purple, data from the United States national population from the registry. So 10% of our patients in Georgia identify as black or African American, 5% as two or more races, and 10% as Hispanic. So with all this context, in 2021, I reached out to our state's newborn screen advisory committee and asked if I could become a voting member. They approved my request and we were able to establish a CF subcommittee to try to um, get together to collect the data that we would need to advocate for changes in our newborn screening program and also to track quality metrics over time. So we were lucky enough to receive a screening improvement program grant from the CF Foundation, which allowed us to clarify and retrospectively collect the frequency of missed and delayed diagnoses in Georgia. And this work was led by another one of our former fellows, Dr. Brittany Truitt. You can see here that while 19% of CF patients born in Georgia um, identify as Hispanic and or black, multiracial or other minoritized races, this group is overrepresented in the delayed diagnoses at 43%, and that's delayed more than 28 days, which is the CFF recommendation for diagnosis. 44% in our missed diagnoses, and 83% of those missed due to um, negative genetic testing. And again, that's the 39 variant panel, and we do not currently have a very high IRT cutoff in Georgia. So we found that Hispanic infants in our state had five times the odds of being missed or delayed compared to non-Hispanic white infants, while black infants had 2.7 times the odds of being missed or delayed. Our genetic counselor, Eileen Barr, led this work looking at case detection for several CFTR assays among our total CF population in Georgia, including pediatric and adult people with CF. And as you can see with our current Luminex 39 variant panel, um, black and Hispanic patients are significantly less likely to be detected compared to our non-Hispanic white patients. And furthermore, two variant detection is dramatically lower and two variant detection, as many of you know, leads to more rapid diagnosis because it minimizes challenges related to transport and other barriers for sweat testing. Next, we looked at the Illumina 139 Next Gen Sequencing Panel, which is used in several other states. And while this improved detection, it remained significantly lower and of note below the 95% goal. And then we looked at a custom CFTR2 based next gen sequencing assay. So this was based, oops, this was based on CFTR2 from 2023. So this does not include, and we'll need to repeat this for the new 1,000 disease causing variants. But we used the approximately 700 um, disease causing variants in CFTR2 at the time. Um, and it improved um, and would be the best for reducing disparities in genetic newborn screening. But very importantly, you can see here that detection of non-Hispanic black people with CF in our state still remains lower than other groups and below that 95% threshold. So we did include all patients in the analysis, even if they had had full genotyping and had no identified variants. And so when we look at the black people with CF in our state who would not be caught on the CFTR2 panel, they're more likely to have rare and poorly characterized variants, private variants, or unidentified variants. And so it will be interesting to look at this with the new CFTR2 panel. So with all this data, we were able to take this to our um, CF subcommittee and advocate for changes in our state. And I'm happy to share that we have been able to make some progress. Um, one intervention that we did was we added a meconium ileus checkbox to our newborn screening card. We actually had several case missed cases of infants with meconium ileus who were born in non-academic NICUs and had a negative newborn screen and came to our attention later. So this will automatically allow the state to run DNA on any infant with meconium ileus. 
Also, we were able to update our state's PCP letter that's sent to all infants with a positive newborn screen with only one variant to do some just-in-time education on CF demographics. So it now states, um, as presented by Dr. Truitt at Poster 747 and in the workshop on Thursday, it now states that CF occurs in infants of all races and ethnicities and that um, minoritized infants are at higher risk for delayed diagnosis. It also provides a timeline that we recommend the sweat to be done within two weeks. And then in April 2024, our Newborn Screen Advisory Committee unanimously voted in favor of implementing the Illumina 139 variant assay in our state. And they expressed support for a long-term goal of moving to a CFTR2 based panel once we got this in place. Now we're working on securing funding, which has its own challenges, but um, I'm very pleased that our collaborators, who've truly been wonderful at the Department of Public Health, despite being very overworked, were able to submit a screening improvement grant for the state lab. Um, so if funded, that would give them funding to validate and implement the Illumina 139 variant panel. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Daly, who's gonna share um, some information about our work with the American Academy of Pediatrics. Good morning, thank you for having me here today. Um, so my call to action came about in a rather peculiar way. I'm a pediatric endocrinologist and I see patients who have CF-related diabetes. And what's really interesting about my patient population is that over 20% of them identify as black. And over the years I've heard gut-wrenching stories around diagnosis, and they seem to have really familiar themes. And I would say that it was firmly rooted in the providers not believing that the person sitting in front of them could have a diagnosis of CF just because of their ancestry. So I had a Michelle Obama moment, and I said, do something. No. <laughs> Thanks. I didn't know what this do something was, but I did know that the providers in Georgia, the family medicine doctors, the internists, the pediatricians, they all needed education. So I turned to this wonderful woman, Dr. Terry Mitfadden. She's a general pediatrician at our institution, and she is a ginormous advocate for children in the state of Georgia. And I told her what the problem was. And she said, you know what, Tanisha? You need to go to the Georgia AAP. So I did. So in the winter of 2023, I had a meeting with the Georgia AAP. Um, I discussed what the problem is. I kind of provided what I thought would be a really great solution which would be cross-discipline education about CF occurring in all individuals. And it was at this meeting that someone said, you know, it'd be nice to educate, you know, folks here in Georgia, but have you ever considered taking this to the national level? Really thinking about involving um, the AAP Leadership Academy with submitting a resolution. So, I left the meeting and said, I'm kind of stepping outside my lane. I'm an endocrinologist, not a pulmonologist. Um, and so I needed to phone a friend. And so that's when I reached out to Rachel. And I said, we have this really amazing opportunity. I know you've been doing a lot of work with the newborn screening program. Can you help with creating this resolution for the AAP? So in the spring, we worked on language for the resolution. We submitted the resolution um, in the spring of 23, which was sponsored by our Georgia chapter. Um, and then um, in the summer, we had two meetings. The first meeting was with the reference committee, um, and that was in July. And this is where Rachel had an opportunity to really speak in favor of the resolution and the importance of passing the resolution. Um, that July meeting, we were able to advance the resolution to the August meeting, which was the um, AAP Academy Leadership Forum meeting, and that was where our resolution was passed. 
So what does the resolution say? Whereas people with CF of minoritized racial and ethnic backgrounds frequently experience considerable delays and distress on their journey to diagnosis and whereas people uh, with CF of minoritized racial and ethnic backgrounds are less likely to be diagnosed on newborn screening compared to their non-Hispanic white counterparts, they therefore be it resolved that the academy educate pediatricians that cystic fibrosis occurs among all people of racial, ethnic, and geographic backgrounds, and be it further resolved that the academy advocate for states to prioritize equity in CF newborn screening by utilizing CFTR sequencing-based approaches or larger CFTR variant panels that reflect the demographics of the state. <laughs> And this could not be done with these, without these four ladies on the right-hand side. Well, yeah, your right-hand side too, <laughs> of the screen. So what have we done with the resolution after it's been passed? So again, going back to me being a pediatric endocrinologist, um, in the fall of 2023, I was invited to speak at the Georgia AAP annual conference, which is a statewide conference. They wanted me to talk about type one and type two diabetes. So I went there with what they asked me to do, but then I also said, and all you pediatricians in the room, here is the AAP resolution. <laughs> um, I also did the same task um, when I uh, presented earlier this year at the Georgia Kaiser Grand Round. So all the pediatricians who are with the Georgia Kaiser Group, I had an opportunity to discuss the um, newborn screening resolution that we passed. Future work um, with our Georgia AAP, we are contemplating doing webinars or a series of webinars um, around the diversity of the CF population in our state. Um, one option that is being tossed around is presenting at one of the two state CME meetings. Um, the only downside to this is only about 8 to 15 percent of the pediatricians in the state of Georgia attend this meeting, so the scope would be really small. Um, we've also discussed an article in the Georgia, um, an article in the Georgia Pediatrician discussing the resolution. Um, establishing a resource page on the Georgia AAP website, or also making an announcement in a biweekly newsletter. And this is an email that's sent to all members of the Georgia AAP. What are some of the things that we can do with this resolution on the national level? And that would be working with um, the AAP sections. Um, and the two relevant sections that we found out would be helpful is the Committee on State Government Affairs. And this would be a committee that would help chapters with advocacy. Um, the other um, section that would be important to work with is a section of pediatric pulmonology and sleep medicine. And one thing that we could do is review and update the content on the healthychildren.org um, website. And this is a parenting website through the AAP. And as you can see with that excerpt on the right hand side, um, it probably needs to be updated a bit. So another option would be to do a patient care page on aap.org. Um, around cystic fibrosis and also include an MOC program for CF and newborn screening. Excellent. So we just wanted to acknowledge the huge team that contributed to these efforts in Georgia. Um, so you can see all the people at Emory and Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, including our two parent partners, one of whom is here today, Rena Barrow. Thank you, Rena. Um, our, 
our Augusta colleagues who've been truly amazing collaborators. I have a feeling Dr. Mackey is out there somewhere, but I can't see you. Um, wave your hand if you're there. Uh, and then our Georgia Newborn Screening Program, which really, I mean, we have um, gotten a lot of support from them, including Dr. Perrot, who is currently serving two jobs as both the Newborn Screening Lab Director and her true role as director of the entire Georgia Public Health Lab. Um, and then we also want to thank uh, Terry McFadden and the American Academy of Pediatrics and our funding. So thank you, and we're happy to take any questions. Thank you all. Are there any questions from the audience? Oh, there's one over here. Pam. Hi. Um, this was great. I, Deanna Green from uh, St. Petersburg, Florida, All Children's Hospital. And um, I was actually just writing this in an earlier session that we needed to get these screening guidelines to the AAP meeting, which happens to be in Orlando right exactly this week. I'm not sure what happened with the hurricane. Um, do you have any thoughts on how we can actually get it into the national meeting? for the AAP next year. Yeah, I mean, we've been able to connect with leadership of both those two sections that Tanisha mentioned, so I think that's a fantastic idea. Maybe we can follow up after conference. Are there any other questions? I have other questions in the box, but they're not related to this specific presentation, so we will hold them. I think we'll have a little extra time at the end. I think Dr. Um, Farrell has a question over here. Dr. Farrell, you have the floor. Yeah. I'm Phil Farrell from <clears throat> me, Wisconsin. Uh, congratulations. I am uh, intimately familiar with this since I've stayed in touch with Rachel uh, for at least a few years. But one thing that uh, we don't always discuss when we talk about advocacy is the importance of uh, persistence and optimism. But one thing about Rachel is she's very persistent. And another thing is she doesn't get discouraged. And there are many leaders, uh, particularly uh, in my experience, I'm sorry to say, CF Center directors that get discouraged and uh, don't have the persistence that's necessary. It's very difficult to move the needle when you deal with uh, uh, public health programs. And so I think that's what one of the take home lessons from the Georgia experience, how important it is to keep your goals in front of you, stay optimistic and uh, be absolutely persistent, tenacious. And uh, thank you, Phil. I 100% agree with that and the partnerships you built. That, that you reached out to each other, you supported each other, and this list of uh, partners here in your acknowledgments. This is fantastic and really a model for the rest of us to follow. So thank Absolutely. you so much for your work. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Thanks. All right, let's see if we can do this without having to lip read this time. We have help. Um, so I'm going to, if we go back one slide, I just want to note um, that the context of this video has to do with the fact that uh, Michelle Wright from NOSF was invited as uh, to give a talk um, for the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine study on newborn screening. And so that is... Um, a, quite a bit of what uh, they're going to talk about today. So um, hi, everyone. My name is Susanna McCauley. I'm an assistant fibrosis researcher and physician Can you guys hear that? Chicago. And please I turn the volume up. My good friends, you know, Michelle who. and Terry Wright. Great to see you. Today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McCauley. Michelle and Terry founded a national organization of African Americans with cystic fibrosis um, after Terry was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis at age 54. Yes. And today I'm going to talk to them about their advocacy efforts and how they are working towards more timely and equitable diagnosis of cystic fibrosis for everyone. And so, um, Michelle and Terry, you started NOASAF after Terry's diagnosis. Correct. He was sick uh, for his whole life. Correct. 
Um, people mentioned cystic fibrosis, but a doctor told him he couldn't have it because he was black. Um, you developed a screening tool with our dear mutual friend, Dr. Jennifer Taylor Kauser. Yes. Um, to help people themselves and also physicians who are less familiar with cystic fibrosis um, learn more about it and, and get a diagnosis if that's what they had. So, um, you know I work on CF newborn screening. Oh, yes I do. And I would just love to hear from you how, after this big journey, how did you guys get interested in newborn screening and end up being advocates for more equitable newborn screening? Well, that's a great question. And part of that was our own unique journey, taking us down the road of not only newborn screening, but developing this tool. And so when you think about health inequality, you want to believe that with everybody having newborn screening, the worst is behind us. But then that's not the case because you're dealing with so many different variants. And as it pertains to a lot of underrepresented populations, um, Blacks, Indigenous, and people of color, you tend to see rare mutations. Like my husband actually has two rare mutations. So from a newborn screening perspective, we wanted to believe if they would have had newborn screening at the time he was born, it would have made a difference. He would not have waited 54 years to be diagnosed. Actually, that was not the case because newborn screening would not have screened for his rare mutations. And that's why we were so excited not only to connect with you, but to respect and understand the research behind what you are doing in newborn screening. So we were interested because we know newborn screening can play a vital part in life and death, and not only life and death, but the quality of life. Yeah, thank you, Michelle, and thank you for your collaboration. Now, um, just a few months ago, um, you had reached out to me because you had an invitation to talk about your work for the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. And um, they are doing a big analysis, a big study that Congress mandated for, to look at the newborn screening system. And um, you were invited to speak to them. So tell me um, how you thought about that when you first got the invitation and then what it was like to go to this really highest body of uh, medical thought in the United States and tell your story there. I mean, to be contacted by the National Academies was surreal. And I knew it was something special. And when I reached out to you and Dr. Taylor Kowser, you definitely confirmed this is special because keep in mind, we received so many invitations to speak week after week, month after month, year after year. And so I was like, I, I, I wanna do this because anytime we have an opportunity to share our voice, to share what we're doing to make a difference, like collaborating uh, with you and others in this, unique field that we want to take advantage of that. So to be invited to the table, I didn't take that for granted. I was actually visiting in my hometown of Tuskegee, Alabama, but I went to the side and took time to really take advantage of sharing who we are as the National Organization of African Americans with Cystic Fibrosis and the things we are doing to advocate for newborn screening, for health, um, equity and so many other things within our platform. Now, I know that um, this is a big study. They gave you a limited amount of time, but what did you tell the National Academies about cystic fibrosis and about newborn screening? 
we share that story um, as we always do our journey to getting Terry his diagnosis and it becoming 54 years late and the advocacy we are doing and working collaboratively and in synergy with individuals like you, individuals like you, Dr. McCauley, that we respect wholeheartedly, like our Dr. Jennifer Teller Counselor and all the other individuals within our circle, you know, Dr. Uh, Megan, McGarry, all of our beautiful collaborators. So we share that. But newborn screening is so important because with effective newborn screening, you don't have to suffer 54 years. You shouldn't have to suffer five years or five months. Newborn screening done right can make a difference. It can catch it, but you have to address the limitations of newborn screening. And I share that with them, that for underrepresented groups, especially those that are BIPOC, Blacks, Indigenous, people of color, there is an increased chance of missing rare variants versus your typical Delta L5OA that you probably would find with 90% of the white population. So we were honest, and that led to um, sharing with them about what we are doing in newborn screening, working together, um, our collaboration with Dr. Jennifer Taylor Council to develop a screening tool to help because for the newborn, the ones that's fallen through the cracks of newborn screening, we want to catch them on the other end with the right cystic fibrosis screening tool. And also what we want to do with Terry Bracewell. So the states can be more on one accord in testing for all variants and not just Delta L508. Yeah, tell me more about Terry Wright's law. What, what is the language of that that you would like to see um, implemented across the United States? In layman's terms, we just want to make sure that all CFTR variants are included and not just your commonly cause variants that could often be missed when it comes to underrepresented individuals. Like again, in Terry's case, he has two rare variants that would not have been called on newborn screening. And so by including all variants, 2000 plus, I believe, then there's a better chance of individuals, regardless of, of race, ethnicity, background not falling through the cracks and helping to fill those gaps. Yeah, yeah. And, and Terry, you have such a wonderful outlook on life. You're so strong and you always show, much, show so much love in your interaction with other people. But do you ever think about what it might have been like if you'd been diagnosed and treated when you were a baby? Oh, wow. Dr. McCauley, if I was a baby during those early stages, things would have been so much different for me because now that I know the diagnosis, the treatments that I'm getting now, I could have started much earlier. My quality of life could have been so much better. Uh, I think about my sports days in baseball. Uh, probably be playing Major League Baseball. Oh, I, probably, you know, yeah. probably, uh, well, maybe not at your current experience. <laughs> Certainly in the past. Right? Your house. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I tell you, it would have made a definite uh, big difference. Even I think about also my big cycling days. I would get out there and ride those century rides and those pelotons. I was pretty strong with this CL, even though I was on the sideline and suffering and, and being very dehydrated because I can remember one time got so bad dehydrated it kind of went into kidney failure mm -hmm. on one of those long century rides but I think if I would have got diagnosed a long time ago therefore I've been taking the treatments uh, proper uh, hydrated myself and would have been preventing a whole lot of things would probably be much stronger yeah Def definitely yeah and um I know you've you guys have faced some of this before, but what would you say to people who said like, well, 
You've already exceeded the life expectancy of the average person with cystic fibrosis or well, it's really not practical to test for every variant. What would you say about that to uh, people who say stuff like that? I would say sometimes people can send in some of the dirty things. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I would say. You know, I, I find that a lot of times we just say some things just because of cliche, you know, something we were read in the book or what we've heard in the past. We just say some things and not being real respectable of a person's feeling and what they really going through. Like in my case, you know, I had a lot of things said to me uh, that were just kind of throwing it out to me, just really uh, didn't, didn't, didn't know my story, quite know my story. Knowing my story, I feel like a person would be kind of careful what they say to me, for sure. <laughs> well, I want to add on to I that. Know. What I would say is imagine it was your loved one. Imagine it was your child. Better yet, imagine if it were you. Absolutely. That's what I would say. Yeah, yeah. Well, you guys um, just show so much um, creativity and strength. Thank you and uh, just such a fierce advocacy for all people with cystic fibrosis. So thank you so much for everything you're doing. And um, thank, you. thank you for speaking to the National Academies on behalf of so many people with CF, both living and yet to be born. Yes. And um, I appreciate your time today so much. We appreciate thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you, everyone. Hi, everyone. My and uh, I recommend working with your friends and finding friends who will work with you. Um, speaking of which, I would like to now um, introduce Eleanor Langfelder Schwind, who's a senior genetic counselor at, I'm going to get it, I'm going to get them mixed up. Um, Lenox Hill Hospital and Northwell Well Health. Um, Eleanor is an expert in cystic fibrosis genetic counseling and um, is going to talk about genetic equity and family autonomy, which are incredibly important as we're um, expanding genetic testing and as we work with families. So, Eleanor, thank you. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you for staying late on a Saturday. And thank you to Marcy and Susanna for the invitation to join this really inspiring panel. These are my disclosures. And my charge for today is to differentiate the mandates of public health newborn screening practice from the autonomy of individuals when we're testing for disease causing CFTR variants in various clinical settings. That's a, that was a mouthful. <laughs> um, in the prenatal and carrier setting and also in the diagnostic and newborn screening realm. And so once you mention the word autonomy, we have to turn to Beecham and Childress's principles of biomedical ethics of autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. And in the general medical practice, we think about autonomy and in that patients who have decision-making capacity also have the right to make those decisions regarding their own care. And sometimes those autonomous decisions contradict or conflict with a clinician's recommendation. Um, beneficence and non-maleficence are to ensure that care is designed to maximize benefit to the individual and also minimize harm for that individual. And justice being fair, equitable, and appropriate treatment for that person. So when we think about it, though, in the newborn screening arena, um, things kind of shift around a little bit. And of course, the goal of newborn screening is really um, mired in beneficence, right? It's to identify individuals who have a certain condition early so that we maximize treatment options, increase their life expectancy, all the, the great things that we know per, about CF newborn screening. 
Um, but in terms of the newborn screening programs, the beneficence and the non-maleficence is also geared towards ensuring that those programs are designed to maximize public benefit and then minimize individual harms. And so one of the kind of sequela of that is that some children will be missed by newborn screening. And we heard really powerfully from the last speakers that what is not equitable is who is missed by those newborn screening programs. Because when we think about newborn screening, we often think about equity and justice. Every uni uh, newborn screening is universal. Everybody has access to it. And states have a plan to disseminate positive results and ensure that there's follow-up and diagnostic resolution for every baby with a positive result. But again, who has a positive result in CF newborn screening is certainly inequitable. And then autonomy, um, it's really to provide choice where possible. And the Association of Public Health Laboratories has supported a position that newborn screening is mandated. One of the expressions of autonomy that we think of is actually um, documentation of informed consent. So people get information and they make decisions about whether a program or a, a test is right for them. And the newborn screening um, kind of by, typically bypasses the consent process. There is typically also an opt out for things like religious reasons, but it's expected that newborn screening is uh, universal. So we kind of think about that on the scales. Newborn screening programs weight heavily on beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice, and are a little bit lighter on the autonomy. So I have a couple cases I just want to share that kind of illustrate these principles. Um, a little bit earlier in my career, I'm in, I've been practicing in New York State. Our algorithm has shifted a bit, but um, we have a two-week-old baby who had a positive CF newborn screen. We use an IRT DNA and then sequencing tier. This baby happened to have a an IRT in the top 5% and two panel variants. And the baby had a positive sweat chloride test, was found to be pancreatic insufficient, and started on, on IVACAFTR as soon as um, that was in the, she reached the FDA approved time. Um, in talking to the patients a little bit more, the parents, it turns out that they had declined carrier screening. Um, they didn't think it was relevant to them because they didn't have a family history of cystic fibrosis, and they didn't really know much more about the screening than that. Um, they had a lot of feelings of guilt and that they just hadn't made the right decision. And in the genetic counseling process, I kind of affirmed that their decision was made with the best available information that they had at the time. And it was also an opportunity to reframe their newborn's diagnosis and their prognosis and their eligibility for modulators and kind of shifted what they thought they knew about cystic fibrosis and kind of envisioned their baby's future in a different way. On a Different note, um, a three-week-old baby who also had a positive CF newborn screen, again with IRT in the top 5% and one panel variant. And this is a little bit of an older scenario when we were still doing IRT DNA with one panel variant. Um, and typically when I would see families who referred with one variant, I would talk to them about the likelihood of carrier status versus actually having cystic fibrosis in the IRT DNA uh, algorithms, it's a, at least in New York at the time, it was about 19 carriers to one person uh, with would actually have an unexpected positive sweat test and have cystic fibrosis. And typically parents would find that fairly reassuring um, in the process. And to my surprise, um, the parents expressed confusion and what I kind of perceived as anger that I was giving them this information. And upon, again, further exploration, I learned that the parents had actively declined CF carrier screening. They understood it, and they had a detailed discussion with their prenatal care provider, and they had, had actively declined the testing. They were unaware that the newborn screener, what they described as the heel stick, would actually reveal carrier status, and they were really quite taken aback to learn of their child's CF carrier status, and then by um, and then also that one of them was obviously going to be a carrier themselves, and that all happened without their permission and their consent. And so our genetic counseling really focused on validating those feelings and trying to um, explain the difference in approaches for, from, for prenatal screening versus newborn screening, and that the goal of identifying babies who needed treatment was why we have cast a wide net. And while I think they, they understood it, they were not happy about it. Um, 
their baby had a normal sweat test result and we did not see them for, for, further, uh, for further discussions or evaluation because. So in just kind of comparing and contrasting these situations in the prenatal setting, the parents were given a choice about the scope of the genetic information that was generated about them. And in scenario one, that decision to decline carrier screening may have been based on misinformation or misunderstanding. So you can kind of question about whether that was a truly autonomous decision. Um, and in scenario two, the parents really made a, an informed values-based decision to refuse the carrier screening. And then they moved into the CF newborn screening realm where the parents were not given a choice about the scope of that information. And in scenario one, that beneficence and justice of newborn screening led to early diagnosis and treatment and everything worked the way it was supp it's supposed to in newborn screening. But in scenario two, that lack of autonomy may have impeded their trust in the healthcare system. So one of my roles in my professional career is to just make plugs for genetic counselors and genetic counseling, so here I go. Um, so the genetic counselor's code of ethics is includes in, uh, statements about that we enable our clients to make informed decisions free of coercion, illuminate the necessary facts, clarify alternatives and consequences, and respect our clients' beliefs, inclinations, and circumstances. Now, every U.S. state has an IRT and DNA-based protocol, whether it involves a sequencing tier or not, which will change soon. <laughs> um, and families really need counseling about the implications of CF newborn screening results in order to act on them appropriately. There are already many newborn screening policies that include genetic counseling recommendations. I know one of the feedback we've been getting on the new recommendations is that they don't include a strong genetic counseling recommendation, but they, they do already exist. So we need to kind of tie, maybe tie them neatly together. The need for and the utility of genetic counseling and newborn screening is really, it's well defined. The benefits include increased adherence to sweat testing recommendations when you merge the genetic counseling and the sweat testing at the same time. Identification of other siblings with CF after one has a positive newborn screen. Discussing reproductive options. Reducing parental anxiety at the time of those discussions. Increasing parental understanding which can be enhanced by multifaceted approaches. Um, Renee Temme has a great study where she randomized um, offer, have patients to either having genetic counseling alone or genetic counseling with a video. And not surprisingly, hearing this information more than once and in more than one way improves understanding. And then we've also got some data that having a genetic counselor involved in the process may improve efficiency of the CF newborn screening diagnostic resolution process. And you know, every state has different approaches to newborn screening, and a lot of this work was done in many different parts of the country, so it can all be kind of put together to help us with our understanding about that. When we look in CF care centers, less than a quarter of CF care centers have an associated genetic counselor. Um, so that's about 44 genetic counselors around the country who really are embedded and, and know cystic fibrosis in depth and that we need to have some work to do to uh, make that number a little bigger and improve that. And the CF Foundation's patient registry has one question about genetic counseling, and it's whether or not parents of children under two years of age have had genetic counseling, not necessarily by a genetic counselor, but by any provider. And again, there's work to do there. A couple of years ago, um, a group of experts came together to develop some uh, consensus statements and recommendations about provision of genetic counseling for parents of infants who've had a positive newborn screen. Um, we used a Delphi process, and uh, with that similar 80% uh, uh, agreement rate, and came up with a list of 17 recommendations. I know this is really tiny. The publication um, is there. I'm going to go into a little bit more uh, depth, but we kind of bucketed those types of recommendations into affirming the prior CF uh, Foundation policy, policy statements about genetic counseling, addressing some infrastructure and logistics, defining some appropriate training for genetic counseling providers and genetic counseling content, establishing a path to equal access to genetic counseling providers, and setting a standard for client-centered CF newborn screening genetic counseling that's respectful of patient needs and autonomy. So I'm going to focus on these last two. 
So one of the questions that came up in this group, and, and Susanna was a part of it, and other people in this room, was really how to best to provide access to genetic counseling around CF newborn screening. And while we've taught, I've already kind of laid out the beneficence issues of that genetic counseling is beneficial in the newborn screening, um, whether or not to offer it to everyone and kind of focus on the justice or offer only if requested and respecting autonomy um, that p if people want it, that they'll ask for it and we shouldn't be kind of forcing it on people who may not want to meet with a genetic counselor for, again, for their own personal needs and values. But the question then becomes, does emphasis on parental autonomy impact equity. And we know from other research that in some healthcare settings, asking questions and requesting additional information or services can be influenced by socio-demographic characteristics. And not surprisingly, more educated people tend to, or people with higher health literacy tend to ask more questions. Um, in this particular study, patients who were white tended to be more active in making requests and asking more questions than their counterparts from other groups. And there can be some uh, situation-specific predictors um, of how patients participate, um, implicit biases on the part of the provider, um, that physician's communication style, and whether or not they're using partnership building skills and supportive communication to interact with their patients. And just kind of applying this to genetic counseling, there's a study from uh, the group in California which has been doing a CFTR sequencing tier on their newborn screening panel for longer than anybody else. And they have very low uptake of free telephone-based genetic counseling, even though it's made available to parents of just the CF carriers identified through the California CF newborn screening program. I think that gets to the question that was at the microphone a little bit ago about what do we do with those people who have have one CFTR variant after sequencing. Clearly, they don't need care in a cystic fibrosis center, but they do need genetic counseling. And again, if that counseling is actively provided or just made available, it looks like people aren't necessarily leaning into it if they don't understand what it is or be unsure about its purpose. And then, of course, people who don't perceive benefits of genetic counseling are going to be unlikely to request it or actively pursue it. And if I didn't mention it directly, there was uh, only 12% of, of carriers in the California program called, called the number. I know I picture like this phone that just never rings at a desk in, in an institution. I know if there's some people from California here, maybe they could provide more, uh, more detail. So the consensus statements we, um, we developed tried to kind of balance parental autonomy, but also making sure that people weren't um, unable to avail themselves of genetic counseling because they didn't know what it was or what its purpose was. And so three of those statements in that long list of 17 include that parents should be offered, to, so actively offered, the option to speak with a genetic counselor when they're informed of their child's newborn screening results. They should be informed of the purpose and availability of genetic counseling but they should also be able to refuse it and, and off, it should be offered in a manner that, that respects their right to refuse or decline genetic counseling if it, again, it's not, if that is not in keeping with their needs or values or it's not right for them at the time. So kind of optimizing, I can't see the, oh, I'm out of time, is that okay? Okay, okay, <laughs> all right, good. <laughs> um, so optimizing that access to CF newborn screening genetic counseling, um, we kind of weighed offering it to everyone, but again, respecting the right to say no thank you or no thank you at this time, and then revisiting those options even in the future, as opposed to offering it if it, it only requested where people who may not know what it is may just say no because they don't know. So I'm sorry I just put up this very colorful slide, but I thank Denise Kay for uh, providing it. And we looked at our genetic rates of genetic counseling in New York State, and you can kind of take a focus on the, the teal section, which is whether people who had uh, two CFTR variants after our sequencing tier but did not have cystic fibrosis, so the group that was being considered for CRMS, CF SPID, and that's so obviously those are our most genetically complex population, and who met with a genetic counselor who had some genetic, what we call genetic education from their CF care providers who and who didn't seem to have any discussions about uh, CFTR genetics with uh, with the CF care team. 
And so we can see that there's a lot, a wide range, ranging from 98% meeting with a genetic counselor all the way down to zero uh, meeting with a genetic counselor. So there's lots of differences in how genetic counseling was offered and made available or not made accessible in different centers. So we've heard earlier today about new recommendations for CF newborn screening. And so now the, um, the recommendation is that every state uh, has, includes a sequencing tier following IRT and CFTR variant panels. And that is in an effort to make newborn screening more equitable. And I haven't had a chance to put my comments in, but I really appreciated <laughs> some of the ones that are already there. And based on the experiences in New York and in California, we do expect an increase in CRMS, CF SPID from these sequencing based programs. And we've got the guidelines for management, which include parental phasing for infants with two CFTR variants. And because it turns out, at least in New York, 15% of those screen positive infants who have one variant on the panel and one variant identified through sequencing that's not clearly CF causing will turn out to have all of their variants in cis and they're actually carriers of CF and they have no clinical, if they have no clinical indication for follow-up, they would be reclassified as carriers, particularly if their sweat chloride is below 30. And so again, kind of a genetically complex scenario. Um, doing the phasing involves testing both parents and so looking at the genetics of the trio and then figuring out the inheritance pattern of all of those variants. And I'm saying two variants, but it could be two or more. I think we've had as many as five variants show up and we have to figure out how those are inherited. Um, in New York, parental phasing is it's optional um, and offered to parents of screen positive infants after they're referred to the CF care centers. It does require a pretty lengthy informed consent process and it's done at the direction of the CF care center. In New York, the, the phasing is free. I'll say again, phasing is free. You And it's done on the newborn screening card. So you get, um, the phlebotomist kind of draws usually either from the finger or the, the vein of, a, of the parents, puts the, the uh, blood on the newborn screening blood spots and we just ship it right back to the state lab. Um, according to our data from I think it's the first four years of the CF uh, sequencing program, 59% of uh, families in the situation were phased by the newborn screening and 41% were not. This might be a little bit um, the actual phasing might be a little higher because people who have had um, prenatal testing or a family history, they may have, we may be able to get the phase without doing the uh, state program. And what we found was that 83% um, of families uh, who reported, were reported to have met with a genetic counselor were phased. 77% of families who were provided education in genetics by a care center physician had phasing, but only 42% of families not reported to have discussed genetics were also not phased. So there may be people out there who think their baby has CRMS, CF SPID, and is at risk for CF and hasn't had, um, so they haven't been counseled about that. They don't know, and they're actually carriers, and they shouldn't be worrying about them themselves in that way or their child in that way, but do need some additional genetic counseling to understand the what it means to be a carrier. And I'll just kind of end very, I'm um, okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> there are programs now to do full genomic sequencing through newborn screening programs. So what we learn about CF will be applied to many other programs. And I'll just end by saying, all the principles of ethics are weighted differently in those public health interventions. We're going to need more genetic literacy, more genetic interpretation and counseling, and we've got some frameworks in place to maximize equity and, and support autonomy. I'll stop there. Thank you. Questions over here. Thank you, Eleanor. That was fantastic. Hi there. Thank you so much, Eleanor. As always, mm -hmm. you um, our excellent presenter, and I'm uh, always inspired by you. Um, I'm Samada, I'm a genetic counselor in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and this is just a comment regarding offering um, genetic counseling. And I work in many different specialties. One of them is um, cancer genetics, and we have experience where um, medical oncologist A versus medical oncologist B um, 
the, their uptake of their patients for which patients schedule with us is drastically different. And probably everybody here, I mean, many of us can say this, it's the manner in which genetic counseling is offered. Even um, the same mm. referral can be provided, but if that provider doesn't really believe in the utility, the value of genetic counseling, or doesn't understand what um, value a genetic counselor can provide, it almost um, is, I mean, we have a difference of 100% uptake of referral for genetic counseling versus 0%. So but, just a comment. Okay. Thank you, Samita. And I would say pub publish that. That would be a great, that would be great to have that in the literature. <laughs> there, there's ways. Yeah. Okay. Beth Kramer from Cincinnati Children's, thank you so much for the talk. You know, having two identified CFTR mutations has never been required for diagnosis of CF. And I know we've had a lot of talk about identifying more pathological mutations and expanding the rinse reading, but I still suspect there will be patients, no matter how fancy we get, who continue to have cystic fibrosis, regardless of having two CFTR mutations or not. And I've had patients go through John Hopkins map testing and still only have one mutation identified and have a sweat of 70 and, and clinical manifestations. I feel like a lot of the recommendations are moving towards using two mutations as a foundational way to identify people off newborn screen. And I, I just, I do somewhat worry we're going to be missing that population since that isn't part of the diagnostic guidelines. I'm going to let Marcy or Susanna take yeah, that I, one, Yeah, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to take this. So there's a context here that is much more within the manuscript itself, um, but you know, when you write something, you always think you're perfectly clear, and this is why it's good to have feedback. So we love feedback. There are very different views on sensitivity versus specificity and whether picking up people, particularly with variants of variable clinical consequence, is a benefit or something negative. We all have our personal experiences and stories with them. One of my stories is someone who was 40 years old when presenting for an IVACAFTER extension study for R117H, who was um, close to lung transplant and screen failed twice for FEV1, less than 40% predicted. Um, swore she never got sick until her second pregnancy when she was 28 years old. So that's just an anecdote. But um, we know that there are states and countries who wish to avoid finding carriers and finding CRMS. And in that case, you know, if you do the almost 1,100 CFTR variants that cause CF and aren't VVCCs or VUSs, then you will have high sensitivity and you'll have high specificity and you will avoid that. There are other people, and this has been written about, um, who feel like if you find a carrier, then one of the parents is a carrier. You can offer testing. Um, they may know their risk for subsequent parasites. So this is, this is why some of these, we come here talking about equity and sensitivity and then we say things that will, any time you improve specificity, you mathematically decrease sensitivity. And the other thing is, and I'll get to this um, in a minute, that um, there are people who you will never find with the laboratory testing done in newborn screening. I have a patient who had a false negative newborn screening test has uh, in a state that does panel sequencing, has a deletion. You're not, you're not going to find it um, with what newborn screen, screening labs are doing currently. So part of what people need to learn is that some CF will be missed. If a child has meconium ileus, they should be evaluated for cystic fibrosis because that population can have IRTs below the threshold more often than other kids with CF, but it's going to happen. So um, that's a... That's long-winded, but that's that's the context of all of this, and I think we need to make sure that that is um, embedded in this. And to clarify, you know, as we increase our specificity and potentially reduce our sensitivity, I, I presume that's going to lead to less CRS diagnoses. That yes, great, yeah, and many programs yes. have that goal. 
Yeah. Uh, probably more in Europe than um, here, but Europe is as even more diverse than the U.S. is in that. that. That's actually why we still have a very high IRT included in there. And I'd note in New York, the very high IRT has been very important to pick up infants who have only one variant on the panel and no, no variants following sequencing, and they're still identifying infants because of the diverse population, but they're identified because of that very high IRT. Yeah. So to your point, hopefully it won't be too much of a decrease in sensitivity. We're still trying to hit above 95%, but we'll be able to identify those infants through other mechanisms. Thank you. Uh, Chris Sirk is also Cincinnati Children's. Hi, Ellen. Hi, Not going to ask about the new guidelines. <laughs> um, but, uh, but specifically, you, you, your presentation was great at unpackaging a really complicated, very complicated multifactorial system and experiences that many of us have. I, I wonder if there's been any experience looking at so, you know, these, these decisions to have genetic counseling or not are made by parents with the best intentions for their children, you know, as a proxy decision maker for them. But at some point, those children become adults, and we often don't have a way to, to <laughs> retouch base with, with those newly adults. And whether parents decided to have conversations with their mm -hmm. children is, is, you know, highly independent decisions. And wondering if anyone has data or experiences looking at, you know, in you know longer newborn screen periods like Wisconsin and Colorado, where we are, you know, now we have a lot of adults who were caught a while ago, and is there sort of a re-engagement at a certain point, and what does what mm -hmm. could that look like? I don't know of any data that about you know how parents are communicating carrier status as the kids are older. You know, there are lots of there's. There are recommendations against carrier screening for children for exactly this purpose, both for their own autonomy to be able to make the decisions about screening themselves, and also it it does that. It is a conversation I have. I'm sure many of my genetic counselor colleagues do too about like, well, what's going to when are you going to inform your child before they go on their first date, on the way to the prom, on the you know, <laughs> it's what it, you know what what do those conversations formal. look like? <laughs> exactly. So. Um, and I, it kind of, it balance, it really balances that, that autonomy and parents, you know, they, they are those proxy decision makers. And then sometimes I've had situations where parents, as their children have gotten older, just kind of go, oh, I don't want to tell, I don't want to tell them. And so, you know, we encourage them, you know, to tell your child, well, they know, you know, you had this test when you were born. Why don't you and your partner go have screening together as a couple? Because that's the, that's the information that'll be most useful to them as opposed to how it might impact their own identity. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, so we're gonna do one. these two questions and we have one online question and then we're gonna move on. So over here. Hi, I'm Georgiana, genetic counselor from Iowa. Um, I know that the new guidelines, you know, specifically you said, you know, aren't commenting on feasibility and, you know, cost of doing <laughs> uh, CFTR sequencing. I do want to kind of pose the question or maybe ask for advice about how to navigate these conversations with your state. Um, just because I know in our program right now, we already have some families and some communities who might decline a newborn screen based on cost. And so how do we navigate this when, with an expected increase in cost with sequencing added? Okay, so uh, I'm actually, I was, Megan, I was looking at Megan or Marissa. Um, do you want to answer that, Megan? Yes. So there's not an increased cost. The sequencing is a part of the newborn screen. So we're not recommending at all that sequencing is going through their insurance. It is part of the dried blood spot. I, th I think That's she was asking that question right. about the dried blood spot. How do we add, how do you add it to the dried blood spot screening? Marissa, did you want to tackle from the CF Foundation perspective? Otherwise, I have thoughts too. Um, so as part of this whole newborn screening work to support the guideline, we know that there's going to be some discussion about that. And so the foundation's putting together an advocacy toolkit as well. Um, we're a small, mighty, but mighty team at the foundation and can only take direct action in a few states to support those discussions. But um, we are going to have a toolkit for states that we will send out when it is completed. Um, and that will hopefully help you have some of those conversations. But you can also reach out to the foundation if you have specific support needs and we can see what we can do to help with that. I would also say we are, we have collaboratives that have been ongoing. Iowa has been peripherally involved in them because of some other activities, but we really encourage you all to join our collaboratives because we'll have these discussions as well. And the new being collaboratives are states 
uh, new breastfeeding programs, state CX centers, and it's states helping each other. So states are literally like, we've done this, this is how you get it done. I'm having this problem, this is how we switch. It's like very hands-on, detail-oriented, and like real world, like sharing of experiences. And I will say that it's been amazing what states have been able to get through. So that's how we're gonna do it, is by all of us working together to get it done. So. Thank you. And so we well, put this on one of our first topics to ask that question. Like, it's a very important question. Thanks. Over here. Well uh, just a comment regarding the uptake of genetic counseling among patients, something else to consider is also coverage by insurance companies. Uh, TRICARE specifically would not cover genetic counseling for their patients, so if you're in a high uh, military area, for instance, you're going to have mm -hmm. a much lower uptake because they're young families who just don't have the facility to do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And it, it, it's definitely a challenge. I know there is a, actually the National Society of Genetic Counselors has a military special interest group. So um, they are working on that as well. So that's going to be a larger issue than just in the CF community, but we can get that done. And our final, and very, well, it's one, this is not a big question, but oh, yeah. should families be given the option to be informed that their infant is a carrier if we are only reporting infants with two pathogenic variants under the new guidelines? Yeah, that's a really great question. It really speaks to an opportunity for autonomy, right, to provide choice where possible. So you could potentially give parents the option to opt in or opt out out of receiving that information. It sounds logistically like it would be very difficult at the state yeah. level to say yes or no. Um, I think we're learning a lot from these genomic sequencing research studies about what parents typically want or don't want. Um, they typically want things that are actionable and some want, uh, and, uh, not surprisingly, it's gonna differ, right? Some people want a lot of information and some people want, want the bare minimum. I'm so sorry, we have to move on. I'm sorry. <laughs> And so I'm going to do the quickest introduction. This is Susanna McCauley. Doesn't really need an introduction in this room, but she's a professor of pediatrics at Northwestern University, and she is just amazing. Oh, yes, and thank you for Eleanor. Thank you. Thank you, Eleanor. Oh, that was amazing. <laughs> and Susanna is also a master at going through slides with some relative level of speed and clarity. Yeah, I mean, actually, after that video, you probably think I can't talk fast, but I actually can. Um, so. Uh, Thanks everyone who's hanging on. I'm here to talk about a uh, project that we're just wrapping up that's awareness, education, and community engagement for CF newborn screening. Um, I have grants that support this work. Um, and this all started with research, and if you're in this room, you've probably read these papers, but in 2019, I was um, very um, humbled to be the recipient of a large grant from the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation to do an evaluation of newborn screening in the United States to date. And um, it was not very good. Lots of diagnostic delays, lots of inequities, and also strong evidence that if you're diagnosed later at a median in the second month of life with a bit of a long tail, you're much worse off in the first year of life with more pulmonary exacerbation hospitalizations at one year with both lower weight and height percentiles and at five years um, with lower height percentile. And remember that height growth makes your lungs bigger. So I'm not a tall person. Um, I would have higher lung function and lung function with survival is actually an absolute and not just a relative. So with all these findings, um, one of the things that you've heard loud and clear today is that um, people who don't know much about CF are the people who we need to reach. And so um, this is really based on responsible dissemination of health and medical research, you know, dissemination. Um, this project is not a formal dissemination project. If you geek out on this kind of um, research, just we can talk about it later. But we knew that we had to meet pregnant people and we had to reach pregnant people, parents of newborns, those primary care physicians who act as gatekeepers in many states. Um, state newborn screening programs, including laboratory directors and follow-up staff, and uh, CF teams and their healthcare systems. And so, you know, my university sends out these limited submission grants, and I got this, um, you know, there was a grant for expanding the national approach to chronic disease education and awareness. So the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention have historically focused on common disorders 
that can be prevented, um, particularly behavioral lifestyle, things like that. So let's think about chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Let's talk about um, prevention and management of type 2 diabetes. But the mor morbidity and mortality of rare diseases cumulatively is extremely high, particularly in children. And so that is what this grant program is about. Um, and so I um, and my team submitted this grant called Achieving Equity for Disease Prevention and Cystic Fibrosis with the audacious claim that if you can diagnose every baby in the first month of life, give them good treatment, and eventually do something that corrects their CFTR or replaces it, that you can have a normal life expectancy and a good quality of life. And we didn't get funded. And then we did, because the CDC actually, they approve or disapprove, and then they rank you. And we weren't at the top of the list. Um, as a result, we got two years of funding instead of three, so we had to work fast, just like I ran to this meeting room this morning. So um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but this is so different from specific aims and research. It was outcomes of what our work is and what the outputs are and they're supposed to be um, sustainable. So Marcy mentioned just a few minutes ago and had a nice poster here that one of the main things that we did um, was to fund and collaborate with Marcy and her group, Yvonne is in the back here, um, to do this um, these collaboratives, and they have evolved over time. This actually started under our 10-year evaluation of newborn screening grant, where it was really focused on identifying issues, like what are the problems, what are the gaps you're seeing, and now it's going much more, um, much more towards equity, but the communication between CF centers and their newborn screening programs is essential. Things like states being able to understand and, and accurately correct data on missed cases is a good example. Delayed cases, we have to work together. This is a system. Um, so one of the first things that we did was we put together um, a monograph. And this is, um, this is on our website. It's been distributed through the CF Foundation. You may have seen it. You may have copies. But if you don't, there's a QR code, and you can get your very own um, PDFs uh, to print or pass around. But um, this is really just a summary of high-level issues um, that we have found in U.S. newborn screening and what the, the consequences of delayed newborn screening are. Um, and this was intended for um, broad healthcare providers. And so we talked about some of the things you've heard about, delayed diagnosis and false negative newborn screening with um, black or African American and Asian babies being at the highest risk. But um, also putting this, this is from a paper that Megan McGarry led, um, looking at detection of one CFTR variant across six common, I'm sorry, nine common variant panels. So on average, um, you're going to only catch 66% of Asian people in the US, 78% of African American or black people. And this is actually based on CF causing CFTR variants in the CF registry by the race and ethnicity of those registrants, participants in the registry. Early evaluation for CF gives you better early life nutrition. That is actually a trajectory towards survival. This is older work, um, but it's true. And then um, you need to refer people right away. This is not something to watch because diagnosis within the first month of life is important. And then the CF Center and Newborn Screening Program reported barriers are a result of that prior collaborative work. Um, another thing we've talked about a lot today is education for primary care uh, pediatricians. And I never actually told Rachel and Tanisha this, but um, when we were writing this grant, we tried to get support from the AAP and to have as a national program. And there is a very um, uh, long system of actually getting approval for that. But we did, um, Laura Lascaz, who's the um, the AAP leader for the section on pulmonary um, and sleep medicine um, recommended that we go through our chapter. The Illinois chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics has a great online education program. 
And so we developed a slide deck, um, two slide decks actually. One is about cystic fibrosis newborn screening, talking about how prompt care improves outcomes. This slide deck is available to anybody who wants it. It can be modified. And it's been used for grand rounds at Lurie Children's Hospital. Megan has um, given presentations using that. And Adrian Savant um, has done it, including at a Louisiana AAP meeting. And then we also have, um, and thank you to Dennis, who um, mentioned that everybody loves mock, ha, ha, ha. But we actually have a mock part Four, which is actually about improving this, the newborn screening office practice system. What happens when you get a positive result? Who does that go to? Who contacts the family? How quickly is that? This is not CF only, but um, you, if you're getting prompt follow-up and good communication to families for CF, newborn screening, you should also be able to do it for kids with other disorders. This education program is online. It's free. Um, it is going to be shifted in the next months to the American Board of Pediatrics website so that people can find it. Um, so I want you to be aware of that, and it's yours to use and to refer people. This grant did not fund research. However, they do allow surveys where there are missing data. And so one of the things that we did um, was a uh, a survey of general population par parents about their awareness of newborn screening, what they understood about it, and what their own experiences were. This was a Qualtrics XM panel. This is a company that um, has uh, sophisticated ways of getting people engaged from broad demographics. We had a total of a little over 1,700 surveys completed nationwide um, or, or entered. Um, completed almost 1,600, and we did use, uh, we did allow skipping, so some of our questions had more data than others. But a couple of things to point out here is um, the, we gave people very broad categories, um, which will be reported in the paper, but um, collapsed about 61% identified as white, 19% uh, Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish, 13% African American, 7% Asian. So fairly representative of the United States, which was our goal. We had a broad range of educational achievement. Um, we gave, as people entered the survey, we told them a little bit about CF and why we're doing the survey. But we asked a question before this survey, had you heard of CF? And there were significant differences. So 63% of Asian parents, 68% of black parents, 66% of Hispanic parents had heard of CF before, whereas 87% of white parents had heard of CF. And so we wondered if this has to do with um, parental response to receiving an abnormal newborn screening test if their child's variants are actually detected and they have a true positive screen. Um, there were a lot of data about um, how people felt about this newborn screening, and I think a couple of the things that really um, stood out to me was feeling supported by your child's health healthcare team. Um, Almost a quarter said uh, they strongly agree, but look at all these people in the yellow who um, strongly or somewhat disagreed. Um, had difficulty understanding where to go for additional health care, was also high difficulty understanding that what the re test results mean. So 56% didn't understand their newborn screening results. This was among 447 of these parents who just, at random selection, had a positive newborn screening test for any disorder. Um, pretty much everybody worried about their kids, um, which is not surprising. So we also um, did a survey that was much differently constructed, um, but done with our same collaborators, about parental experiences of CF diagnosis through newborn screening in the US. And um, we got a lot of information before we constructed this survey. So Megan and I worked with Michelle Wright from NOACF. Um, we had some group meetings. Megan also worked with people in the center who, parents in the Center for Latinos with Cystic Fibrosis to really try and construct a survey that would um, be a, a really relevant to what our community members said. 
Um, the other thing that we did was that we sent this out um, through uh, NOACF and in partnership with the Cystic Fibrosis Research Institute and the Bunnell Foundation because we found closely collaborating with CFF Community Voice that, Voice that they had a very low number of people who actually um, identified in races and ethnicities where we know that we have um, the most risk of missing people. Um, and so as a result of this strategy, we were able to get about 8% um, Hispanic people and 17% black or African American people who responded um, with um, other uh, categories here. But we had 373 um, people, uh, parents of children with CF. 19% um, said that they strongly agreed with uh, the process of getting their child CF diagnosis was smooth. Um, we had 7% uh, and 10% um, disagree with that. Um, so uh, most of them agreed, though, or were neutral. Um, there was 35% uh, of people felt that it take too long to get information about their child's diagnosis. And um, a fairly significant percent felt that there was diagnostic delay by based on their race and ethnicity. And so all these things, these top box things, are really things that CF centers can do something about and that primary care doctors can do something about. Um, the other thing that I wanted to point out here that's relevant to CF centers is um, among people who um, answered this question about how long did it take after you were notified, only 21% uh, were seen in a CF center within three days, um, and a very large proportion were seen after eight days. And remember that the guideline is to see someone within three business days of them of you knowing about them, because we know that um, being uh, contact is, is different in different states, how people get into CF centers. So there's work for us to do in the CF community. So um, reaching parents in the public is very important to us, and so we um, developed public education materials based on our findings from parental surveys. Um, and we also, uh, once we developed these, we did vir virtual focus groups of Chicago area parents. And I'm going to give you the feedback first because we changed what we did based on it. But they, in general, they very much liked it. They thought they were simple. Um, they uh, liked it better than what they'd received at birth hospitals. Um, they felt that um, what we put together was uh, representative of their families with diversity standing out in the materials. But they did want, they did have a number of good suggestions, including providing more detailed information about each newborn screening test. And they also said, we want to see this when we're pregnant, not when we're exhausted from having a newborn. Being a parent, that resonated with me too. So um, this is; these are some of the materials we had, at, we have come up with, and um, we did think people need to know about newborn screening. A lot of people had low awareness of newborn screening overall. Um, so we put this to, together as a simple slide. This is what newborn screening is: it's the blood, it's the pulse ox, it's the hearing test. Um, we had some specific cystic fibrosis ones. And then we had, you know, keep yourself informed, know the newborn screening results, and other ones that are very action-oriented. Um, so uh, we've got QR codes on here, which go to the CF1 goes to our CF newborn screening landing page. The newborn screening general ones go to our general newborn screening landing page, from which you can go back to our CF screening landing patients. So this is for our community. But this can also be for your community. This was funded by a federal grant. And so you can have, if you want them, these unbranded materials. And you can put your logos and your QR codes for where you want people to go onto here so that they can get the information um, in your region. Um, finally, um, 
we had a national indicator report. Um, this was something that um, kind of slipped uh, under my radar when we applied for this grant, but every grantee has to do one of these. And I was very, very fortunate to have amazing support from Alex Albert and Run Yu Wu at the CF Foundation to put this together. So this is a comprehensive description of cystic fibrosis in lay terminology with a strong emphasis on newborn screening. Um, we are making progress in this Age at First event that is very relevant to later newborn health. See, this is we got to be within the first four weeks of life for diagnosis and treatment diversity of the population and, and take home points. You can have this, you can get it through this QR code, we'll email it to you, you can find it on our website. Um, we like it and we hope you do too. Um, so, so many collaborators here um, that I am not going to go through them since we are at the end of this session. I will stay on for any questions for those of you who have time to stay, and I'm available um, through the app and through email, but I just want to thank everyone who participated, many of whom are in, in the room, and um, we hope that this will make a difference, and I think when we have advocacy and education and guidelines, the hope is, and this is a comment back to people who are talking about resources, we want the resources and the education to go to all of the people who make decisions so that we can get every baby with cystic fibrosis diagnosed in the first month of life. So thank you very much and um, have a great afternoon. Dr. Yes. McCauley, I have a question. Of course. I know everyone wants to leave. I apologize. No, everyone can leave except the ones who want to ask questions. Ask question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think the hardest part about newborn screening is the newborn. You alluded to it in this talk. Like, I do remember the stacks of papers that I didn't read. And um, <laughs> I had spoke to Eleanor yesterday about when we have something that's an opt out, it's very easy for, or that you have to opt into it's hard um, and have we looked into like communication preferences of parents or families one of the things we did in our center based on our sweat tech who felt like babies weren't getting in fast enough is he started calling families as soon as we got the order from the pediatrician and it cut our time to sweat test in half um, but I had my babies 15 years ago so maybe if I was having a baby today my preference would be something else. And I was just wondering if we were actively investigating that as a method of helping families know what screening is and why they should be taking advantage. Yeah, I love that question. And I will actually tell you, um, based on some of this work and, so, and some of the feedback that we did get from people, including this, like, we want to know more before our baby's born. Um, we actually uh, submitted another CDC grant that's really focused on um, more community engagement to refine, like, general public in person, working with some federally qualified health centers and community groups um, locally. I, I have a, you know, bonafide public health community researcher. Um, and again, we got approved but not funded, so I don't know if I'm gonna do that or not. I'm certainly gonna look for other avenues to do some of these things. Um, I think that what we, uh, we do have, though, is we do have information, if incomplete, and material to say, we need to be talking to our birth providers. So in the state of Illinois, it's almost all MD, OBGYN, but in some states, there are many deliveries done by family medicine doctors. Um, midwives are used um, broadly. There are certainly midwives in Illinois. In some states, um, there's a higher proportion. So we need to get to these groups as well um, so that prenatal care and, um, you know, also understanding like limitations on carrier screening, because we haven't addressed this, but, but I have a family whose um, daughter's uh, diagnosis was delayed because this black family, you know, mom had a variant, dad 
ACMG 23 didn't find that is predictable. Well, so so there are lots of their carrier screening is normal, right? Because yes, yeah. They don't have CF, but they are a carrier. And so yes, yes, and, and really people don't, you know, depending on what you do, like there's always residual risk and people who have had carrier screening and one of the parents doesn't have a variant, they, um, they can delay. They think they're, you know, and, and we've seen families like that too, whose kids CF diagnosis was delayed a little bit because they thought it was ruled out and it takes, you know, people like, People don't like gray zones, <laughs> especially with their health and their child's health. So I'd encourage anyone else with questions to please come on up. And everybody else, have a great rest of your meeting and a safe trip home. Thank you very much.